Welcome to EEPG Pathshala. I am Professor Devarishri Prasad Nath and I teach Cultural Studies at Tejpur University. Today we will look at the first module in the paper Comparative Literature and Culture. This module titled Comparative Literature and Cultural Studies 1 has been written by me. In this module we will be looking at the growth of the discipline of cultural studies and its impact on comparative literature. Comparative literature can be defined as an interdisciplinary, cross-cultural and transnational literary analysis. It is generally accepted that comparative literature owes its origin to Goethe, the German thinker who probably used the concept of world literature for the first time. Goethe believed that literary texts are able to transcend national and linguistic borders. In fact, he had a firm conviction that, I quote, like all things of supreme value, art belongs to the whole world and can only be promoted by a free and general interaction among contemporaries. Interestingly, Goethe was also one of the earliest critics to acknowledge that the historical context of literature is important, a view that was also considered to be important by subsequent thinkers. For instance, in India, Rabindranath Tagore advocated the idea of Vishwa Sahitya. Makaran Paranspe has explained the meaning of the word Vishwa Sahitya and its difference from the general understanding of the term world literature. To quote Tagore, each of us must make his way forward according to his own means and abilities. The world is not merely your plow field plus my plow field plus his plow field because to know the world that way is only to know it with a yokel-like parochialism. Similarly, world literature is not merely your writings plus my writing plus his writings. We generally see literature in this limited provincial manner. To free oneself of that regional narrowness and resolve to see the universal being in world literature, to apprehend such totality in every writer's work and to see its interconnectedness with every man's attempt at self-expression, that is the objective we need to pledge ourselves to. Henry Remax defines comparative literature as, I quote, the study of literature beyond the confines of one particular country and the study of the relationships between literature on the one hand and other areas of knowledge and belief, such as the arts, example painting, sculpture, architecture, music, philosophy, history, the social sciences, the sciences, religion, etc. on the other. This indicates a widening of scope of the discipline of comparative literature. He went on to say that comparative literature, I quote, is the comparison of one literature with another or others and the comparison of literature with other spheres of human expression. Unquote. Today, the scope of comparative literature has considerably widened. We can note the change in the orientation of the discipline in the following definition proposed by Stephen Tortesi D. Zapitnik. I quote, Comparative literature means the knowledge of more than one national language and literature and or it means the knowledge and application of other disciplines in and for the study of literature and second, comparative literature has an ideology of inclusion of the other, say, a marginal literature in its several meanings of marginality, a genre, various types of texts, etc. Unquote. Even in this very brief survey of comparative literature that we have undertaken here, it can be seen that the scope and range of the discipline has been constantly reviewed and revised. In any case, comparative literature was traditionally seen as a discipline that attempts a comparative analysis of canonical literary texts across time and space. More often than not, such analysis revolved around Western literature. In fact, one of the criticisms quite frequently faced by comparative literature till not very long ago was that it was too Eurocentric in its orientation. Gayatri Spivak, for instance, has pointed out that the Eurocentric bias of the discipline prevented it from paying serious 
academic attention to the languages of the southern hemisphere. Having said this, it would be imprudent to assume that the development of the discipline of comparative literature has been along linear lines. There have been many currents and cross currents that have gone into the making of this discipline of comparative literature as we know it today. One of the cross currents that worked against the inherent Eurocentric bias of the discipline was the new ideas coming from disciplines such as cultural studies that came into prominence since the 60s of the last century. Of course, apart from cultural studies, the rise of feminism and post-colonialism forced a radical re-evaluation and decanonization of the literary text and the literary canon. These movements have together brought about a shift in the focus of literary and cultural studies away from an exclusive concentration on European literatures. Today, researchers commonly engage in comparative studies that cross not just chronological, cultural, disciplinary, linguistic and national boundaries, but also cross the hierarchies of high and low canonical and popular literature very often. It is thus necessary to look at how the scope of comparative literature has been widened by cultural studies, a discipline whose history is much more recent in comparison to the former. Hence, there is a need to look at the impact of cultural studies on the field of comparative literature. Cultural studies is a way of studying culture which is different from the way it is generally done in other disciplines. For one, cultural studies is primarily concerned with the commonplace and everyday aspects of life and culture. Thus, it is more oriented towards a study of popular culture. It is concerned with the dress that we wear, the music that we listen to, the films and television programs that we watch, and the food that we eat. Cultural studies is also interested in questions of identity. The processes by which we become members of a particular class, ethnic group, or gender is a cultural process. This cultural process is successful because it appears to be commonsensical and inevitable. Cultural studies teaches us how to look at commonsensical knowledge critically, telling us that there is nothing inevitable about this process, but that it can be resisted and even altered. Cultural studies thus interrogates society's structures of domination. Structures of domination operate in the formation and continuation of class, gender, and other forms of hierarchy. Cultural studies owes its origin to a new form of Marxism that emerged in Europe in the 20th century that sought to understand how capitalist societies work and how to change them. This means that while the object of inquiry in cultural studies may be popular culture, there is always a political intent in doing this. Practitioners of cultural studies believe that popular culture can be a proper site of academic investigation because it provides important clues to our understanding of the structures of domination in society. Richard Johnson pointed out that cultural studies does not undertake the study of popular culture for purely academic purposes, but encourages us to look at popular cultural forms as inseparable from the analysis of power and of social responsibilities. When we say that cultural studies deals with the commonplace and everyday aspects of culture, we should take note of the fact that culture encompasses multiple realms of everyday life. The term culture in cultural studies can signify types of cultural artifacts, for instance, television, literature, newspapers, paintings, film, new media, and so on as well as the discourses about these artifacts and phenomena. Emergence of Cultural Studies, the Cultural Debates and the Theoretical Legacies Before we look at the emergence of the discipline of cultural studies, it would be worthwhile to consider further what makes the approach to culture in cultural studies distinctive. The preconception that thinkers brought into any discussion on the concept of culture traditionally was that it represents the best part of human civilization. 
human civilization, having gone through different stages of development, finally arrives at culture. Since in this view, which was fashioned by the Enlightenment, different cultures of the world are in different stages of evolution and development, only a few of these qualify as, I quote, authentic, unquote, or real culture. Thus, the conventional understanding was that in a society, only a small minority possesses culture. The vast majority of people were not equipped to possess this real culture. Let us look at the intellectual movements that were mainly responsible for bringing culture to the forefront of academic discussions. We'll also look at how these movements question the hierarchies of high and low canonical and popular literature, thus paving the way for the discipline of cultural studies. Let us begin by trying to understand the concepts of thinkers and writers like Matthew Arnold, Afer Lewis, and others concerning the growth of mass culture, the early cultural critics. Matthew Arnold divided the British society of the 19th century into three classes, barbarians or the aristocrats, the Philistines or the middle class, and the populace or the working class. He believed that culture was on the decline thanks to the role played by all the three classes. For Matthew Arnold, culture was a pursuit of perfection, which was an integral and in internal entity of the self. What alarmed Arnold was the fact that the Industrial Revolution had brought about an age of obsession with the external and the superficial aspects of life, such as machinery and materialism. Matthew Arnold said, I quote, The kingdom of God is within you, and culture, like manner, places human perfection in an internal condition. In the growth and predominance of our humanity proper, as distinguished from our animality, unquote. Thus, he is here seen to echo the then widely prevalent idea of culture as the antithesis of materialism and utilitarianism. Arnold believed that his idea of culture could help to check the demazing effects and tendencies of industrial capitalism. For Lewis, the culture of the common masses can be divided into two kinds. A. The folk culture, which is organic, and B. Mass culture, which is a product of modern industrial society. Like Arnold, Lewis believed that the Industrial Revolution shattered the healthy and organic culture of England. Like Arnold, Lewis also believed that civilization was threatened by the rise of mass cultural forms. In such a situation, it was the responsibility of an enlightened few to teach people to discriminate between authentic culture and mass culture. The following quote best reflects the views of Afer Lewis regarding culture. I quote, Upon the minority depends our power of profiting by the finest human experience of the past. They keep alive the subtlest and most perishable parts of tradition. Upon them depend the implicit standards that order the finer living of an age, the sense that this is worth more than that, this rather than that is the direction in which to go, that the center is here rather than there." Unquote. As we shall discuss shortly, many of the basic tenets of the discipline of cultural studies seem to be directly opposed to the views of Lewis and Arnold. And yet, it is the fact that their writings actually prepared the ground for cultural studies in many ways. Firstly, Lewis was probably one of the first critics to bring mass cultural forms like advertisements to the purview of serious academic discussions. Secondly, both of these thinkers pointed to the political potential of culture, the fact that culture could be a powerful agent of social change. This was to prove one of the most important ideas for the discipline of cultural studies. Lastly, both the thinkers highlighted the importance of fostering the ability of people to differentiate between right and wrong. In this context, one is reminded of what Jauddin Shardar says, I quote, The tradition of cultural studies is not of value-free scholarship, but one committed to social reconstruction by critical political involvement, unquote. 
critical Marxism. Cultural studies owed its theoretical legacy to the critical Marxism that evolved in Europe in the early part of the 20th century. While traditional Marxism considered culture to be the byproduct of economic processes, later generation of Marxists came to consider culture as capable of influencing the economic base and thus the issue of culture came to generate a lot of academic interest by itself. It is believed in traditional Marxism, for instance, that culture was merely a part of the superstructure of society and thus simply a product of the economic and industrial base. The Frankfurt School was chiefly responsible for revising the established tradition of Marxism. To begin with, the Frankfurt School grew out of the Institute of Social Research, which was founded in 1923 at the University of Frankfurt. One of the major purposes of the Institute was to study the processes of social change. Max Horkheimer was a philosopher and a sociologist. He served as director for the years between 1930 to 1958. The school also included Theodor Adorno, Eric Fromm, Franz Newman, and Friedrich Pollock. Over the years, many other celebrated Marxist thinkers, such as Harbert Marcuse, Walter Benjamin, and Leo Lowenthal, were associated with the group. The Frankfurt School provided a reinterpretation of Marxist philosophy along with some of its most fundamental notions such as commodification, reification, fetishism and critics of mass culture. I quote Edgar and Sedgwick. In the hands of these thinkers, critical theory was envisaged as a rigorous critical engagement with social and philosophical issues which aimed at the cross-fertilization of research methods derived from the social sciences with a Marxist theoretical framework for conceptualizing social relations." Unquote. We frequently find that the Frankfurt School has been depicted as being critical of the Enlightenment. However, it is important to point to the fact that in reality, they believe that we had not had too much but too little of the Enlightenment. It would therefore be better to think of the Frankfurt School of thinkers as choosing a middle path. They try to maintain a balance between, I quote, Edgar and Sedgwick, a self-critical avoidance of dogmatic truth and claims, and a desire to remain politically committed and not to relapse into what is, for them, the equally undesirable position of cultural relativism, unquote. Theodor Adorno was the most articulate advocate of this position. Hegel's notion of dialectics offered Adorno the groundwork for his notion of negative dialectics. The Hegelian dialectic moves through the stages of thesis and antithesis to the final stage of synthesis, which presents the absolute truth. Adorno abandoned the stage of absolute truth. Although Adorno does aim for the truth and does for security and stability, for him, as Edgar and Sedgwick say, I quote, the only way to grasp contemporary reality is to describe it in always two contradictory propositions and to hold both to be simultaneously true and false. Louis Althusser, a structuralist Marxist, was another important thinker who revised some of the most traditional assumptions in Marxism regarding culture. He argued that ideological apparatuses such as the law, the family and the educational institutions are as significant as economic conditions in producing willing workers for the capitalist system. The importance of the concept of ideology had already been pointed out by Karl Marx. However, while he described ideology as false consciousness, Althusser believed that ideology interpolates individuals as subjects. For Althusser, I quote, Ideology is a representation of the imaginary relationship of people to their real conditions of existence, unquote. It is mainly thanks to Althusser that the pioneers of cultural studies could insist that culture is neither simply dependent on or neither is it completely independent of economic relationships. 
Though initially, Althusser's theory found a lot of followers among the practitioners of cultural studies, it gradually came to be seen as too deterministic, for it does not offer the possibility of an alternative order. It was the writings of Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist theorist and political activist, that seemed to provide a way out of the determinism of Althusser. Gramsci's main contribution to cultural studies have been his notions of agency, which is associated with the notion of free will, and the possibility of chains and the concept of hegemony. Hegemony for Gramsci refers to the process of making, maintaining, and reproducing a dominant set of meaning by the ruling class. In other words, hegemony refers to the process by which a dominant group maintains its control over other groups, not through force, but by winning and shaping ascent. This process works itself out in the realm of culture. Most importantly, for practitioners of cultural studies, Gramsci talked about the power of the individual to bring about change. Structuralism Ferdinand de Saussure's account of the social function of language suggested that language is about a set of shared assumptions and conventions even though the relationship between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary, it is social convention that imparts stability to the system. As a discipline that is primarily concerned with the process of production of meaning, cultural studies was obviously greatly influenced by structuralism. Graham Turner says, I quote, Structuralism has many variants, but its common characteristic is an interest in the system, the sets of relationships, the formal structures that frame and enable the production of meaning. Structuralism thus brought about an understanding of culture as a location where meaning is both generated and experienced. Culture in structuralism became a determining productive field through which social realities are constructed, experienced and interpreted. There was another sense in which structuralism was important for cultural studies. Cultural studies was influenced by structuralism because, as pointed out by Terry Eagleton, structuralism had argued that all literary texts were the products of the same underlying structure, making it difficult to assign an, and I quote, ontologically privileged status, unquote, to literature. As Terry Eagleton says. Thus, to continue with the same example from Terry Eagleton, from the structuralist point of view, the same, I quote, deep structures could be dug out of Mickey Spillen as well as Sir Philip Sidney, unquote. In this way, the aura surrounding great literary works was done away with. Structuralism was also responsible for shifting focus away from the traditional question of aesthetics in literary criticism. Structuralism was not interested in establishing the aesthetic merit of a work of art. Instead, the focus was on the formal structure of literary text. Structuralism saw culture as the primary object of study and approached it most often by way of the analysis of representative textual forms. The forms and structures that produced meanings was what they focused on and quite obviously, therefore, they tended to be less interested in the interpretation of individual text than they were in finding out the underlying structures of different texts. Probably the most important contribution of Sassurian structuralism to cultural studies was the idea that cultural texts are constructed with signs that can be read like a language. Culturalism in contrast to the structuralist, the culturalist and British historians in particular resisted structuralism. It was too deterministic, they said, too comprehensive a definition of the force of ideology as we have seen in the case of Louis Althusser, who was a structuralist Marxist, identified particularly with Raymond Williams and E. P. Thompson. Culturalism believed in the power of human agency. The culturalist argued that hegemonic forces could be resisted and that history could be changed by radical human effort. 
E. P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class was one of the most influential texts in the foundation of the discipline of cultural studies. This book marked the beginning of the writing of a new kind of history. Thompson successfully wrote a new kind of book on culture and history. Thompson's history, instead of being elitist, was narrated in the form of popular culture. It brought to focus the lives of ordinary people who were both the victims and agents of socio-historical changes. Raymond Williams' books such as Culture and Society and The Long Revolution helped to set up the contours of the discipline of cultural studies. For Raymond Williams, art and society are closely related to each other. While emphasizing the materiality of culture, he also pointed to the need to view cultural texts as being embedded in culture. Williams's method of cultural materialism thus believes in a relating material culture such as films, cars, fashion to socio-historical chains, explaining how the culture produced by ordinary people is repackaged and sold back to them. Popular culture, therefore, is a very important concept in cultural studies. Raymond Williams was one of the major forerunners in shaping the contemporary understanding of popular culture as a site where the politics of everyday life may be examined. Williams pointed out that culture is generally thought of in terms of the relationship between high and popular culture or between aesthetic and anthropological notions of culture. Williams explains, I quote, Popular was being seen from the point of view of the people rather than from those seeking favor or power over them. Yet the earlier sense had not died. Popular culture was not identified by the people but by others and it still carries two older senses, inferior kinds of work, for instance popular culture, popular praise as distinguished from quality praise and work deliberately setting out to win favor, popular journalism as distinguished from democratic journalism or popular entertainment, as well as the more modern sense of well liked by many people with which of course in many cases the earlier senses overlap. The recent sense of popular culture as the culture actually made by people for themselves is different from all of these. It is often displaced to the past as folk culture, but it is also an important modern emphasis." Unquote. Williams here raises a series of important issues concerning the authenticity, power and representation of culture, tracing the evolution of cultural studies. Key figures involved in the rise of cultural studies in Britain were working class and they had a powerful personal involvement with this sphere of culture. Interestingly, all the four founding parents of British cultural studies were post-war English-based uh, intellectuals Richard Hogarth, E. P. Thompson, Stuart Hall and Raymond Williams were adult educators and university professors on the left who wanted to understand the intersection of class and nation at the level of lived experience and social structure by foregrounding what Miller calls the culture and sensibilities of industrial workers. Certainly, the influence of the scholarship students was important in recasting the examination of popular culture in Britain in the 1950s and 1960s. Raymond Williams begins the essay Culture is ordinary with a description of moving from Wales to Cambridge as an undergraduate. It is in a food space that he experiences the symbolic violence of those who claim authority over culture. In this essay, Raymond Williams says, I quote, I was not oppressed by the university, but the tea shop, acting as if it were one of the older and more respectable departments. Here was culture not in any sense I knew, but in a special sense. The outward and emphatically visible sign of a special kind of people, cultivated people. They were not, the great majority of them, particularly learned. They practiced few arts, but they had it, and they showed you they had it. If that is culture, we don't want it. We have seen other people living." Unquote. 
Many practitioners of cultural studies highlight their origins as being, in some respects, from outside the mainstream of academic culture. Williams acknowledged dates to his stint as an adult educator in culture and society, 1780 to 1950, communications and the long revolution. Similarly, Stuart Hall also noted the importance of developing his ideas in negotiation with his adult education experience. Ben Carrington argues that the formation of cultural studies was first and foremost a political project aimed at popular education for working class adults. It is undeniable that working in adult education brought the pioneers of cultural studies into contact with a range of subcultural groups not normally encountered at universities. While today popular culture occupies a position of great importance in cultural studies, there was a strong academic tradition in Britain that was opposed to popular culture. Culture was considered to be the cultivation of the mind, taste, manners and artistic achievements of a particular people. This unfortunately was believed to be lacking in the masses. This so-called culture and civilization tradition which was adhered to uh, the above stated meaning of culture was concerned by the development of popular culture. Matthew Arnold perceived the rise of the new urban Philistine culture as a threat to culture. Looking back today, some would argue that Arnold's fears were not wholly unfounded. Cultural studies employed Marxist theory to show how existing power relations have been instituted and legitimized. However, in contrast to traditional Marxist belief, cultural studies insisted that culture is neither purely dependent on nor completely independent of economic relationships. Gramsci's model of hegemony offers a less mechanistic notion of determination and of the domination of a ruling class than Althusser, where Althusser's theory does not grant space to change. Gramsci explains how change is paradoxically built into the very system itself. Structuralism brought about an understanding of culture as a location where meaning is both generated and experienced. Structuralism was also responsible for shifting focus away from the traditional questions of aesthetics in literary criticism to the processes of generation of meaning in literature. Raymond Williams one of the pioneers of the discipline of cultural studies wrote, I quote, Culture is ordinary. That is where we must start. Unquote. An analysis of culture should begin by looking at the world around us, the social experiences that shape our identities and various groups with which we associate. E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class was a key text in the growth of cultural studies. It not only helped to reconstruct the English working class, but ushered in a new kind of history. Instead of focusing on the elite and the powerful, Thompson's history looks at the lives of ordinary people who were, according to Graham Turner, I quote, the agents and victims of historical processes, unquote. This was a history of cultural formations and social relations in the context of popular culture. Cultural studies has considerably altered our understanding of the text. A text in cultural studies is anything that generates meaning. Thus, as we seek to deal with a new form of comparative literature that would be informed by perspectives of cultural studies, throughout this course we will explore ideas and areas beyond the boundaries of the quintessential literary text. Through the term text, we will try to explore other ideas that are associated with cultural studies and the term takes will be used and appropriated from the point of view of cultural studies to include issues that are generally kept outside the margins of traditional literary criticism. Richard Johnson stated it clearly when he said that the text is only a means in cultural studies. Hence, much of our analysis in these modules will involve non-evaluative 
contextual analysis of media text including films and advertisements to try and understand the ways in which power relations are regulated, distributed and deployed within industrial societies. In addition, we will explore the vast array of areas that have been thrown open for comparative literature by the advent of cultural studies. With this, we come to the end of this first module on comparative literature and cultural studies 1. Thank you.